Hello, everybody. This is Josh Valentine, the Communications Manager with the Clean Coalition. Thanks for attending our uh, webinar today. This is, I believe, the fourth webinar uh, for our Transmission Access Charges campaign, which started about uh, a year and a half ago um, in order to remedy an unfair charge in California uh, on the energy system. And this this particular webinar uh, focuses on uh, on the the latest updates and progress that we've we've been making in the transmission access charges campaign. Uh, with us today to present are Katie Ramsey, staff attorney for the Clean Coalition, and Daryl Mahalik, associate associate executive executive director for the Dynamic Grid Council. And uh, a few administrative things to take care of before I pass it along to Katie, who will present first. Uh, the webinar recording and uh, downloads and access to the slides will be sent to all attendees who registered uh, in a few days after the webinar. Uh, we'll also be archiving the webinar on our YouTube channel. Um, if you have a question, we're going to be fielding some questions at the end of the webinar. Um, after uh, Daryl finishes his presentation, uh, please type them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. And as you can see from the slide, um, it might look a little different than what's presented here. And if you have any general questions about the Clean Coalition and our work, uh, please email us at info at clean-coalition.org. I'll also have some uh, contact information on specific tech campaign um, questions at the end of the webinar and um, I'll show those to you a little bit later. So right now I'm going to pass it along to Katie Ramsey and she will present on the Transmission Access Charges campaign. Great, thanks Josh. So let me just pull up the presentation real quick. All right, so do you see my slides? Looks good, Katie. Great, thanks Josh. All right, so thanks for attending today's webinar, everybody. Um, as Josh mentioned, this is uh, the fourth in our series. And this particular webinar, in addition to going over the transmission access charges issue, um, we are planning to focus on how this issue and our, the Clean Coalition's proposed solution uh, can address transmission costs as a whole. So without any further ado, let's get started. Real quick, here's the Clean Coalition's mission. Uh, we work to ensure that more electricity comes from uh, local renewable energy sources. So this provides major benefits to ratepayers because local renewables provide electricity that doesn't travel over the transmission grid in order to get to where it's needed. So when you, when you place local renewables close to where the demand is, this results in huge savings and avoided transmission costs and other resiliency, environmental, and economic benefits for consumers. So real quick, before we start diving in, I wanted to start with a couple of upfront highlights. And if you've tuned into any of our previous webinars, this may be a little, uh, at least two of these three items will be something you've seen before. So first and foremost, the, the transmission access charge is um, are currently misapplied to energy from local renewable projects, even though this energy doesn't use the transmission system. So that's, that's the big problem that we're, we're focused on here. And the Clean Coalition's solution to this is to meter transmission access charges at the transmission energy downflow point. This is a methodology that's already in place for most municipal utilities in California, and so we would just want to see the entire state follow that methodology. And this is the big update, SB 692. Senator Ben Allen introduced a bill that would implement this solution and fix the tax market distortion. So those are the big highlights, and let's go through um, all of the other pieces of today's agenda. So this is what we're planning to go through today. We're going to give a quick overview of transmission access charges and explain why the rate per kilowatt hour of transmission access charges is rising. We'll cover the tax market distortion on local renewables. And then I'll hand it over to Daryl to, to discuss how local renewables reduce peak load. And we'll, he'll provide a few recent examples of tangible savings that local renewables can produce for California ratepayers. Then he'll talk about how local renewables can help meet renewable portfolio standard goals. 
and then we'll go through the next steps for the TAC campaign and how uh, you and or your organization can get involved. So what are transmission access charges? Transmission access charges are volumetric usage fees designed to pay for California's transmission system. So this covers not only the cost of building, maintaining, and financing the system, it, uh, it refers to how, how this process works. So the California Independent System Operator, or CAISO, is the organization that manages and operates the transmission system. And they collect transmission access charges, or TAC, uh, from utilities based on each utility's share of transmission usage. So the utilities then pass on those costs to their customers through somewhat opaque transformation that appears on your, on your bill as a transmission and distribution portion of your bill. So throughout California, CAISO assesses TAC on a volumetric basis. That means that this is, there's a TAC rate that's applied to every kilowatt hour of energy, regardless of what time of day that energy is delivered. So this is the way it works for the big IOUs. This is the way it works for um, uh, municipal utilities. It also is how it works for intra-California transmission balancing authorities like LADWP. And it's how it works for energy that's coming to California through the energy imbalance market. So even though some of the terms can change a little bit depending on what kind of entity, entity you're looking at, really transmission access charges apply on a volumetric basis to all of the energy that's coming through the transmission grid. So this is what the trends look like for transmission access charges. And this is, these numbers that you see on this chart are projections that come from CAISO. So Ki the TAC rate has been increasing between 9 and 12% year over year uh, across California. So here we've got uh, in this chart an example using PG&E's TAC rate to show what that means for the TAC rate moving forward. So if we assume a 9% year-over-year year increase, we can see that starting today where the TAC charge is roughly 1.8 cents per kilowatt hour, over the course of the next 20 years that's going to rise pretty quickly to 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So when you're looking at a 20-year contract for a renewable energy project, which is how uh, most of these projects are reviewed and compared, the levelized 20-year cost for transmission access charges comes to about 3 cents per kilowatt hour. So that effectively increases the wholesale price of energy in California by about 30%. So this, this speed of growth is pretty surprising when you compare it to the other prices that are incorporated into the cost of energy. So for example, if you look at the rate of increase or really the rate of decrease in the cost of generating electricity, you'll see that this is in pretty stark contrast. A lot of the costs associated with electricity are, are tapering off, but transmission costs in California are expected to rise. And there are two reasons for this. There are two main drivers that affect transmission investments. The first is the growth in peak load conditions. So this is on the, the day of the year that it, where the transmission grid is in the most highest demand, what is the quantity of electricity that the transmission grid has to deliver? So that has been growing slowly over time. And as consumers demand more energy, the growth in peak load conditions moves forward. The other main driver of transmission investments are policy goals. So when the state of California says that they want to increase the number of renewables in the energy mix, that drives the need for new energy resources in new places in many cases. So what that means is if you're going to start getting more of your energy from huge solar plants in the Central Valley, you're going to need transmission facilities to deliver that energy to where the consumers are. So that's how policy goals impact uh, the rising transmission access charges rate. So keep in mind, as I had said just a little earlier, this is, this is the 20 year trend for the TAC rate moving forward. It goes up and up and up as we need more and more transmission. This is in pretty stark contrast to the price of actually generating electricity. So if we take a 20 year look backwards, we can see the cost of renewables has been dropping significantly over the last 20 years. So when you c combine this falling uh, cost for generating electricity, and you compare it to the rising costs of transmission access charges, what this all boils down to is that more and more of the money that we spend on energy is going to be going to transmission facilities. At least that's, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that we invest in more local renewables. Local renewables help address transmission costs in two ways. First, they produce energy during peak load conditions. 
So if local renewables are producing energy near to where consumers are, that means that they can help accommodate these growing peak loads closer to where they're being consumed. So if you can produce that energy closer to where the consumers are, you don't need to build a new transmission line to accommodate that growing load. Another way that local renewables help address transmission costs is that many local renewables, especially um, wholesale distributed generation, can help meet California's RPS targets. So if you're trying to compare uh, what kinds of uh, generation sources we'll be looking at over the next 13 years as we work towards the 50% RPS target, then if you increase the number of local renewables who are, that are meeting that, those goals, you can meet those goals without building more transmission. So that means that it can cost, in many cases, less than building new renewables in, the cent in centralized power plants that require new transmission to deliver it. In addition, local renewables offer a lot of other benefits. Um, they help keep energy dollars local. So it means that more of a community's energy spend stays closer to where those people actually live and it spurs economic development and creates local jobs. Also, local renewables can come online faster than remote power plants. Because most of these projects are much smaller than centralized plants, they don't require 20 years to build and bring online. Of course, there are environmental reasons to be interested in local renewables. They protect pristine environments by not only reducing the need for new power plants, but also they reduce the need for associated transmission infrastructure. Plus, it improves local energy resilience and helps democratize control of energy production. So these are all the benefits that local renewables offer. And it's, it's very clear that these renewables can save ratepayers money. So why don't we see more local renewables winning procurement decisions? Why, why don't we see the tax rates falling if, if local renewables can save all this money? Part of the answer to that question is that the current method for applying transmission access charges severely distort the market for local renewables. And so if you've paid attention or tuned into any of our, our previous webinars, uh, you've probably seen this next part of the presentation before. But just in case this is your first webinar, let's walk through the TAC market distortion. So here's the main problem. Local renewables are subject to transmission access charges, even though the energy that comes from local renewable projects don't travel through transmission lines. So the reason for this is that the way that KISO assesses transmission access charges is by looking at how much energy crosses a customer's meter. So you should see this little red arrow next to the house on the far right of the chart. So when KISO assesses transmission access charges on the customer energy downflow or the customer meter, where that red arrow is, not only is it applying transmission access charges to all of the energy that comes through the transmission grid, it's also subjecting energy that comes from local renewable projects to costs associated with the transmission grid, even though this energy never comes across transmission lines. So by looping in energy from local renewables to the baseline for what TAC is applied to, that means that it artificially makes the cost of local renewable energy look more expensive than it is. The fact of the matter is that when you place local renewable projects on the distribution grid, there's less demand for new transmission infrastructure. So it's already saving customers money by avoiding or deferring the need for new transmission investment. So they're already reducing transmission costs. So tacking on the tack to that energy makes it much more expensive than it really should be. And here we can use an analogy to, to explain this in a different way. So if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're pretty familiar with the bridge tolls, particularly like the costs of crossing the Golden Gate Bridge. So you know that if you cross the Golden Gate Bridge, there's a little toll booth where you used to pay cash to a toll booth operator, but now they just kind of check your, the RFID chip that you have on an easy pass. So it's kind of like you, this, the, the operators are gathering money associated with the cost of building and maintaining that bridge, but they're not assessing it at the end of the Golden Gate Bridge. Instead, if they were to assess the charges associating with building and operating the Golden Gate Bridge, every time that you pull your car out of the driveway, that's a good analogy for this. Because it's, those charges are not being attached to the actual use of the system. They're being just spread out throughout every time anybody is driving their car. And so what this means when you're looking at the, the market signals for building local projects versus central projects is that the costs associated with delivering energy over long-range long transmission lines 
are being spread to all projects. So that means that functionally, a lot of utilities don't even pay attention to the cost of delivering electricity because it's the same no matter where that energy production is being sent from. This is a big problem. It skews the market signals. So what it means is that DG projects look much more expensive than they actually are, and it disadvantages DG projects and local renewables and energy procurement, which results in fewer and fewer DG projects being improved. By contrast, Kaiso actually uses a second system in California. This is the way that it works. They operate, uh, they assess transmission access charges at the customer meter for most of the, the, the customers in California. They apply this system for anyone who's subject, who is a customer of any of the big IOUs, like Pacific Gas and Electric, San Diego Gas and Electric, or Southern California Edison. This is the system that Kaiso uses. But for most municipal utilities, they use a, se a second, better system to assess TAC. So for most municipal utilities, Kaiso assesses transmission access charges based on the transmission energy downflow, or rather the amount of energy that crosses from the end of the transmission grid at the substation to the distribution grid. So this makes a big difference for local renewables in most of these municipal utility territories because it makes the market system market signals for the cost of delivering your energy much more accurate. Because local renewables don't contribute to transmission costs, that means that in these municipal utilities, the energy that comes from those local systems avoid the transmission access charges. So this also showcases a principle that we refer to as the user pays principle, where utilities that are using the system pay in proportion to their use. This is in stark contrast to when you assess transmission access charges at the customer meter because everybody's paying regardless of how much they're actually using the grid. For municipal utilities in California, they have much more accurate signals. By only paying for the energy that comes off the transmission system, their market signals are much more accurate for local renewables. So we know that this system is already in place in California and it works for most municipal utilities and also for uh, balancing with authorities within California, like LADWP. Technically, they operate their own transmission grid, and so they use this system as well. So, in California, there are these two different systems where transmission access charges are measured at either the transmission energy downflow or at the customer energy downflow. And what the Clean Coalition's solution is to resolve this issue is just to use that one better system. Every utility should be paying transmission access charges based on the amount of energy that comes through those substations. So if Kaiso would only meter transmission usage at all substations and assess TAC only on the energy that's actually delivered through the transmission grid, we would see much more accurate market signals for the cost of actually delivering your electricity. And this would make a huge difference in procurement decisions. It would mean that the market distortion against local renewables would be fixed throughout California. So the cost of implementing this would only be the cost to make sure that there are revenue grade meters at all of the substations. So the Clean Coalition has done a little bit of research and found that there would be no more than 2,000 substations that would need that improvement, and the meters cost about $10,000 per piece. So that means that the overall cost to implement this, this proposal would be no more than $20 million, or approximately $1 per customer. Over the long term, this would make a big difference. It would allow us to avoid transmission investments of up to $38.5 billion over the next 20 years. So $20 million in cost would lead to about $38.5 billion, billion with a B, in avoided transmission costs. So this isn't a subsidy or an incentive or a cost shift. This is an improvement in the market signals for what it actually costs to deliver your energy. So it would lead to more cost-effective markets, better market outcomes, better outcomes for ratepayers in terms of avoided costs, and it would mean that there would be a real principle involved of only the users pay, where you pay in proportion to the amount that you're actually using the transmission grid, as opposed to just paying regardless of where your energy comes from. So let's talk about that $38.5 billion. So remember earlier in the presentation I showed you this blue line, which, was the, which is the business as usual case. This is how transmission access charges are expected to grow over the next 20 years. Clean Coalition modeled out what the market impact would be if this actually leads to more distributed generation coming online, more local renewable projects being deployed. 
So what we found out that the projected attack rate increase would be would be represented by this red line here. So you can see that the attack rate still grows, but it grows at a much slower rate. And the difference between these two lines refers to how much money could be avoided, how much money could be saved by avoiding transmission uh, investments where it's not needed. And what that would equate to is about $38.5 billion in savings for California ratepayers. So it's huge savings, huge market impact, and this can make a big difference. We think that this, this fix would not only benefit, would, would cause all these benefits in terms of environmental, economic, and um, resilience benefits, but it would just save ratepayers money. It would mean that they could have more confidence that their energy is really the most cost-effective um, choice. There's another big benefit of this fix, though, and that is that it sets up the electricity market of the future. So fixing the TAC market distortion on local renewables would, would allow the, uh, the market to evolve a little bit closer towards what we see as the, the future. Uh, it would better accommodate distribution system operators, so or DSOs. DSOs are an idea of how you could have a specific operator who would manage the distribution grid and optimize local resources in a way that's very analogous to how the ISO operates the transmission grid. So CAISO, uh, California's ISO, sends price signals to transmission-connected resources, and they try to optimize uh, uh, the use of the transmission grid. But there are some limitations to this. That CAISO doesn't have visibility into the distribution grid. But if you could set up a system where a DSO, or distribution system operator, could have that visibility and operate to manage the local grid, the distribution grid, then they would have the ability to optimize local resources, including local renewables and other distribu distributed energy resources like, like small-scale batteries, uh, community microgrids. Um, uh, basically, it would allow them to create a market for local energy sources in a way that we're expecting many more resources to come online. Anytime you see a, a neighbor who puts up a solar panel on their roof, that could be the kind of resource that a DSO could help optimize. So this DSO concept would offer significant energy security and a more efficient use of the distribution grid. And we see this as uh, playing a big role in the future of the electric grid. So in some ways, we can, we can think of municipal utilities as kind of a, a DSO uh, type where they have a financial stake in optimizing their local re resources, but they also interface with the transmission grid operator. So part of why we see this happening for some municipal utilities is there are two reasons. First, they have clear market signals showing that local resources can avoid transmission costs. So that makes those resources much more valuable to municipal utilities than those local resources might appear to PG&E, for example. So because of the way that municipal utilities benefit from the correct TAC methodology, they have a clear market incentive to operate efficiently on their, their own distribution grids. This is something that doesn't, doesn't really exist right now for a lot of the, for the other IOUs. Another reason that municipal utilities can act like this or can operate in this way is that unlike the participating transmission owner utilities like PG&E, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, and Southern California Edison, municipal utilities don't have a conflict of interest between building more transmission and investing in local resources. PG&E, for example, has an incentive to build more transmission because they're not only guaranteed to recoup those costs, they're guaranteed to recoup a 10% return on equity for those investments from their rate pairs. So they have this big incentive to invest in more transmission in a way that most municipal utilities don't. Instead, the municipal utilities don't have a big incentive to build more transmission. They have an incentive to build more local resources. So aside from that conflict of interest, there's really nothing preventing utilities from, from operating like DSOs now. Um, but this is a concept that's a little bit forward thinking, and so we're hoping to spread the ideas and um, have more discussion on this, this vision. So the TAC fix brings all of this vision closer to reality by allowing distributed resources to avoid the TAC. So it creates a market incentive for optimizing the distribution grid in a way that doesn't currently exist. So here's a long list of, of benefits that we see the tax fix is actually providing. First and foremost, it saves energy consumers at least $38.5 billion in avoided transmission costs over the next 20 years. It would also be a big benefit to make local renewables instantly more competitive 
so that we would see more local clean energy. In addition, over the long term, we think that this could lead to increased value for owner of, owners of local renewables for their own energy generation. Um, it could also prompt local jobs, and it has all sorts of environmental, economic, and resilience benefits, and it helps lead us a little bit closer to the electricity market of the future. So these are all the reasons that the tax fix is important and why it has a lot of benefits to offer to California. Um, but that first one is, is pretty important. The fact that it can avoid $38.5 billion in transmission costs is, is very compelling. And so now I'll hand it over to Daryl so that he can go through some examples of huge transmission projects that were um, avoided or delayed because of the growth in local renewables. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Daryl to go through how local renewables reduce peak load. All right, thank you, Katie. Pull up my slides here. All right. So to dispel any doubt about the massive benefits all California ratepayers would receive from creating a simple, fair, and transparent electricity marketplace through the transmission access charges or tax fix, I'll review in detail how local renewables impact both of the two primary drivers of transmission investment that Katie mentioned, peak load and RPS goals. So first, regarding peak load, this slide shows that in 2015, CAISO's peak load was on September 10th at 4.53 p.m. California's peak loads generally occur during July, August, or September, often due to the use of air conditioning when people return home after work. This next slide shows how renewables do reduce peak load. This slide assumes that, let's, let's assume that there are 10,000 megawatts of solar in Los Angeles facing southwest. Now, in the case of local solar, more than 30% of its nameplate power production, or 46% of its maximum daily production, does contribute to reducing peak transmission usage. For example, a typical one megawatt DC west-facing rooftop solar installation in Burbank, California, would still produce 354 kilowatts of power AC at 5 p.m. on a typical September 10th day. All this data comes from the NREL system advisor model using a standard PV watts configuration. What the chart shows is if you layer on production from this assumed 10,000 megawatts of solar in Los Angeles, that the peak load shifts slightly later and is reduced by 3%. So again, therefore, increasing deployment of local solar does slow or avoid the need for additional transmission capacity investment because it does reduce peak load. Next, I'll, I'll review some examples about how specifically uh, local renewables um, do actually avoid transmission investments. So this kind of indicates that uh, adds to the previous story about reducing peak load and how that story translates into real world savings. This table lists four uh, anecdotes about transmission projects that were recently canceled as a result of increased deployment of distributed energy resources and also lists one recent study by the California Energy Commission or CEC about the ability for disturb energy resources to avoid transmission and planning in the first place. The table also shows the millions of dollars that ratepayers saved as a result. So three of these five anecdotes are in California. If you look at PG&E here in the second and fourth example, you can see that they've already saved over $325 million as a result of increased disturb energy resource deployment. The CEC indicates another $300 million in potential savings in California and the San Joaquin Valley, this middle example. So these are very significant savings. I'll talk a little bit about the first one as an out-of-state example because it's kind of an interesting example. In 2013, Long Island Power Authority, or LIPA, they faced the need to invest about $84 million in transmission upgrades east of its canal substation. However, in 2014, they decided to 
to have a clean solar initiative. And as part of that initiative, they offered a seven cents per kilowatt hour premium to 40 megawatts of appropriately cited local solar distributed generation in order to encourage enough local generation capacity to avoid the 84 million of new transmission costs. The end result was a net savings of 60 million. Now to further discuss these transmission project cancellations and, save, and resulting savings, on the next couple slides I'll share some quotes from staff at various transmission grid operators, utilities, and the California Energy Commission regarding the role of distributing resources in creating these ratepayer savings. I'm doing that because I think it's powerful to hear the actual words spoken by these key industry players. So first of all, this slide shows quotes from CAISO's own staff, you know, the California Independent System Operator, regarding those two PG&E transmission project cancellations that have already saved over $325 million. First, the top quote, in 2015, regarding PG&E saving $192 million, Eric Eisenman, Director of ISA Relations and FERC Policy for PG&E, he conveyed uh, the utility support for the most recent plan, including the project cancellations. But he said the need for those is just not there anymore because load cut forecast has flattened in the service area from a combination of energy efficiency and rooftop solar, which eliminates the need for these upgrades. So second, in 2017, regarding PG&E saving $145 million by canceling the gates Gregg project, well, the Jeff Billington, who is ISO's regional transmission manager, said that due to the currently forecasted increases in the development of distributed energy resources and due to late, later peak energy demand in the area, the need for the project will be pushed out. You know, PG&E had been planning to build a 70 mile, 230 kilovolt transmission line, but that was canceled because of the need was reduced due to distributed energy resources. This next slide has some quotes from other industry players regarding how distributed energy resources reduce the need for transmission projects. First, a quote from the California Energy Commission, the 2000 CEC. In 2016, the CEC, they, they studied the potential benefits of distributed resources in the San Joaquin Valley. And what they said in a CEC staff paper in July 2016 was that DER, distributed energy resources, can potentially provide ratepayer benefits in comparison to traditional system infrastructure investments. Particularly, the primary benefit is transmission infrastructure deferrals. And again, they cited an estimated ratepayer benefit of over 300 million, specifically for the San Joaquin Valley region. Second, in 2017, regarding a 10 mile transmission line that the local transmission grid operator for New Jersey had thought was necessary, Peter Lanzalotta, who's consultant to the New Jersey Division of Rate Council, he said that the need for this project, initially determined in 2011, has been diminishing ever since. And he further noted that the reason for the re reduced need was the latest load forecast showed that there were lower peak load projections in 2031 and 2032 than had been previously forecasted. Finally, in 2017, Southern California Edison, or SCE, wrote a letter to the California Assembly Committee on Energy stating that demand forecast for transmission infrastructure is expected to decline due to distributed energy resources. So now I'll talk a little bit about how local renewables help meet Renewable Port Portfolio Standard, or RPS, goals, and save repair, save repairs a lot of money as a result. Now, the urgency, there's urgency to fix this transmission cost market distortion because California, as you probably know, just increased its RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard, to 50% by 2030. As a result, Utilities and other load serving entities like community choice aggregators or energy providers will need to buy more renewable energy. And the question is how much of this new renewable energy required to meet the new RPS will be in remote locations that require extensive 
expensive transmission to deliver energy to ratepayers. You know, for example, as shown in the right column. Versus how much of the new local of the new renewables to meet the RPS will be local renewables, as shown in the left column, that do not require new transmission investments to deliver their energy. And of course, to the extent that demand can be reduced for additional transmission facilities by building local instead of remote renewables, fewer new transmission facilities will be built, saving money for ratepayers. So it's important to note that if the PAC transmission access charges market distortion is not fixed and California continues to operate an inefficient, inefficient energy marketplace, the state's going to overbuild this expensive trans transmission infrastructure required to deliver energy from remote locations, and ratepayers are going to pay a lot more than they need to to meet the 50% RPS. And this slide, of course, this slide's main point is about, is about economics, but of course, it's important to remember, as Katie mentioned, that local renewables do create other benefits. They create local jobs, they enable resilience, and the pictures in this slide indicate how they minimize the environmental impact of energy generation delivery. And the pictures in the left column demonstrating one local option for meeting a 50% RPS obviously, obviously indicate that local renewables are more environmentally friendly than remote renewables because you build them on land that's already disturbed and you don't need new transmission lines to be built on pristine land to deliver the energy. But let's get back to the main point about economics. So this slide, this slide shows that the urgency that I mentioned to fix this market distortion, this transmission market distortion, is, isn't an abstract notion that might have some future impact. It's a concrete issue that is already affecting California ratepayers. So in 2016, the leaders of the state's energy agencies, you can see their logos at the, at the top of the slide here, they convened California's Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative version 2.0, or READI, R-E-T-I 2.0, to examine where potential new renewable energy generation could be developed and to assess what transmission may be needed to deliver this energy to California's load centers, where people live and work. The final report was released in February 2017. As you can see in the first bullet point, this READI 2.0 study indicated that $5 billion of new transmission investment above and beyond currently planned projects would be required to meet the 2030 goal of 50% RPS. And the reason is, again, that if you build, well, the prime remote areas for building remote renewables would require additional transmission investment in order to interconnect those remote renewables and deliver them to where people live and work. It's also important to note that this $5 billion is just the upfront capital cost. Over the lifetime of the transmission asset, total ratepayer costs would be much more than that, some multiple, as much as five times the upfront cost due to payments for guaranteed return on equity and operations and maintenance. So furthermore, to meet the 50% RPS requirement in 2030, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has already initiated three different projects, three different transmission projects they're listed here. The Barron Ridge transmission, renewable transmission project's goal is to transmit renewables from the Mohave Desert and Owen Valley areas, remote areas. The second one, South of Haskell, is all about further improving the, that ability of the first project to transfer energy. And the last one, the Victorville LA Basin upgrade project, would enable transmission of renewable energy from out of state resources. In, in El Dorado, Valley, Arizona, and Southern Nevada. And of course, these out-of-state resources don't create local jobs or resilience in California, but California is paying for transmission to deliver their energy, though. Now, California's, I'm sorry, CAISO's own recently released 2016-2017 transmission plan even lists specific sections in the document about the impact of meeting RPS targets on transmission planning and investment. But CAISO itself has recognized this and is already starting to, to deal with it officially in its planning processes. Now I'll wrap up this discussion with a with a brief mention of, of market prices. You know, to try to answer the question, would the tax fix actually enable local renewables to be more cost effective than remote? 
right now, or would we need some additional location-specific pricing to, to tip the balance, such as the locational net benefits as being explored by the CPUC? Well, one way to answer this question is to look at the prices of RPF contracts, Renewable Portfolio Standard Contracts, and compare those prices to the contracts in California's Renewable Market Adjusting Tariff Program, REMAT. Now, the, the, the problem with this is that the most recent publicly available data was from 2013 and 14. However, what that data indicated is that in 2014, RPS contracts had an average cost of 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour. And in 2013, the California's REMAT prices, and by the way, the REMAT program is, is has these projects have a maximum size of three megawatts, so they're generally local. The prices from the REMAT program were 8.9 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's just 1.5 cents more per kilowatt hour than the RPS contracts from the year later. And that 1.5 cents gap is less than the current total transmission access charges for PG&E, SCE, and SDG&E, the three major IOUs in California. So it's not completely clear what's the current price differential in these contracts, um, but, but the anecdotal data indicates that the similar gap exists, and so the point is that the tax fix is large enough to make a difference in procurement decisions either right now or, or very soon when you're deciding whether remote versus local. So now I will turn the presentation back over to Katie so she can talk about next step steps in the Clean Coalition's campaign and what all of you can do to help. Great. Thanks, Daryl. And you know, just to chime in on what Daryl was just mentioning about um, uh, the prices, the price points for essential generation projects versus local renewables using remats, um, remat data. You know, part of the reason that we're talking about prices from three years ago is that current prices for RPS eligible projects are not publicly available. So this is this is using the most recent data that it is publicly available. We can tell that the price points between these two different project types are close enough where the tax fix could make a real difference in procurement decisions. So that was a great find, Daryl, and uh, thanks for bringing it up. So now uh, I will cover where all this brings us to right now and what our next steps are for the transmission access charges campaign. So uh, if, if this is the second or more webinar that you've followed on this topic, uh, you'll remember that the Clean Coalition has been actively engaged with CAISO to find an administrative solution to the TAC market distortion. So CAISO recently uh, suggested that the Clean Coalition raise this market dis distortion in a fourth stakeholder initiative uh, that is currently scheduled to start in Q1 2017, so really any day now. Uh, we will be planning to participate in the Transmission Access Charges Structure Stakeholder Initiative. This will be the fourth stakeholder initiative that the Clean Coalition will be commenting on in order to raise awareness for the TAC market distortion, and it will be the fourth stakeholder initiative that Kaiso has said would be the best place for us to discuss it. So we are continuing to operate in good faith with Kaiso to find an administrative solution to this issue, and Kaiso has recently publicly stated its commitment to reconsider the tax structure in order to make sure that it aligns with California's policy objectives, which include a growing number of renewable and distributed resources. So uh, they say that they're committed to this. We are definitely committed to working with them to find a solution. But in addition, the Clean Coalition is also looking for a legislative solution. So this is the big news since the last webinar. Uh, the Clean Coalition is supporting SB 692, which Senator Ben Allen of LA County uh, has introduced. Uh, it's basically a bill that implements the TAC market solution uh, that the Clean Coalition has um, constructed. And so we found a number of different legislative champions on this issue, including Senator Allen, Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco, and Assemblymember Mark Berman of the Bay Area. So we are pushing forward on SB 692, and it's a very exciting time. Uh, the bill is currently before the Senate Energy Utilities and Communications Committee, and it will be the subject of, of the April 4th um, hearing by that committee. So we are actively gathering support 
trying to make sure that our supporters are signing on to letters to these different legislators and trying to make sure that um, the California State Legislature is aware of this issue and is working to find a solution that really represents the best impact or the best um, best uh, best incentives for local rate pay for ratepayers, California ratepayers. So uh, we are working on that. And if you uh, remember from our previous webinars, part of the reason for urgency on getting a fix to the TAC market distortion was the threat of CAISO expansion. So the California Independent System Operator was working and is directed by SB 630, SB 350 to submit a proposal to expand beyond California to other service territories. Um, and this is a directive that they have to submit a proposal by the end of this year. So this is something that Kaiser is directed to work towards, but following uh, President Trump's election, there is understandably a lot less enthusiasm for expanding beyond California. Um, part of the issue that we see with Kaiser expansion with respect to the TAC market distortion is not only is it taking up a lot of Kaiser's attention, so we're not getting uh, direct attention to this issue, but in addition, if Kaiso expansion does move forward and the oversight for that organization changes beyond uh, California's borders, that means that there will be new stakeholders involved in transmission um, planning and procurement in a way that we do not expect out of state actors to have any incentive to make sure that California's local renewables are accurately priced in the marketplace. So we are still watching whether Kaiso is moving forward with expansion, but we are not expecting it to be as likely as it had been previously before the presidential election. So the Clean Coalition continues to work with a broad range of supporting organizations. We have 73 organizational supporters and uh, we are always looking for more, more help. So uh, if you are interested in the Transmission Access Charges campaign and find it to be as important an issue as we do, then these are the ways that you can get involved. Uh, you can endorse the TAC campaign by authorizing use of your logo on the TAC campaign website. You can contact your local legislator's office indicating your support for SB 692. Uh, we have letter templates and photo scripts available, so just reach out if you have any trouble finding those, but they're on the TAC website. You can also spread the word to other organizations who would be interested in this campaign to help influence legislators and CAISO. Also, you can submit comments directly to Kaiso on this market distortion and the different ways that this might be addressed. As I mentioned earlier, the Review Tax Structure Stakeholder Initiative is slated to start any day now. Um, so when that stakeholder initiative kicks off, we will be planning to submit comments and we can absolutely help support other organizations who are interested in raising their voice at that um, or throwing in their voice at that stakeholder initiative. And then last, uh, if your organization is interested or able to provide lobbying or financial support, uh, we would love to work with you. We would love to work with you anyway, but especially if you can help us pay for this campaign. So with all that, uh, here's how you can get in, in touch with us. This is the cleancoalition.org slash TAC website. You can just click on that link and see our TAC campaign page. If you have any questions, you can email me at katie at clean-coalition.org. If you're interested in endorsing the TAC campaign, uh, please reach out to Daryl. Here's his email address right here, daryl at dynamicgroupcouncil.com. And we look forward to interacting with you. And with that, I can turn it back to Josh. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Daryl, for your great presentations. I just wanted to emphasize that on this transmission access charges campaign that the Clean Coalition has uh, been involved with. Katie and Daryl have been uh, leading the campaign with with, uh, with gusto and they've been doing a, an amazing job with it and um, I'm looking forward to the next webinar to see what, what kind of progress we make. Um, so right now we're going to be going into the Q&A portion of our webinar and uh, Daryl and Katie I'll pose some questions that have been sent in from some of our attendees um, so, fasten your seatbelts and, uh, you know, choose uh, amongst yourself which question you'd like to answer. But uh, the first one is, 
have the investor owned utilities openly oppose the solution you propose? So we have, I, I can take this, this question. Uh, we saw comments from, uh, I believe it was PG&E and sdg &E in the last Kaiso stakeholder initiative and they have openly opposed this adjustment and they say uh, you're able to to pull up their comments on the Kaiso website if you want to know exactly what they said but I would say that the gist of it was that uh, they thought that customers who use DG Energy are still using the transmission grid and therefore this change in billing determinant doesn't make sense and we respond to that with uh, yes, that is true. To the extent that any customer who uses energy is also using energy from the transmission grid, the, our proposal here would make sure that they are paying in proportion to uh, their use. And you know, this, uh, a point to make here is that transmission access charges are assessed on utilities, and then utilities filter those costs down to their rate pairs. So it's not it's not a direct link between an individual consumer's choice and what they see in their transmission and distribution charge because of that filtering of those costs down by the utility. But what it means is that when utilities are incorporating DG resources, local renewable resources, then they should be paying tax in proportion to the amount of the transmission grid that they're using. So that is absolutely fair and it definitely reflects the user pays principle. So that's, that's a big reason why um, a big issue that we do, we're not sure that the utilities are really understanding or maybe they're just not making a very nuanced argument on that front, um, but that's part of the issue. Um, another issue that opponents of this campaign have raised is that this would result in a cost shift. That it means that people who are like the wealthy uh, solar panel owners aren't going to pay their fair share of transmission charges um, and it's going to make everybody else pay for it. And we want to shoot that argument down right away. Because that is not uh, that's not how this works. So we would say that the existing market is already an unfair cost shift by making utilities that use and invest in local renewables pay more than their fair share of transmission access charges. By spreading the cost of the transmission system across all energy, including local energy, it artificially makes local renewable energy look more expensive. It artificially decreases the costs of delivering transmission source energy and it is effectively a subsidy of utilities towards transmission de dependent resources. So the existing market isn't functioning effectively. It's not, it's not operating as a true market should. And so by fixing that system and making sure that there are real signals for the cost of delivering energy, we would be resolving an existing cost shift. It's true that this would mean that the bills would be different um, following the implementation of this fix, but we've run the numbers and looked at what the actual changes in cost would be, and it would be less than 1% for any utility. So, I mean, to the extent that who pays what would change on day one, that's true. It would be a change, but it would be an infinitely small change that would make a big difference for actually making sure that the market signals for building new transmission moving forward and the market signals for building local versus central projects would be much more accurate in the future and would result in massive savings for all California ratepayers. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, we've heard a little bit from the, the IOUs on this topic, and that's a, a quick summary of their highlighted arguments and what our responses are. Thank you, Katie. Another question from uh, an attendee. Can future community choice programs play the role of future DSOs? Uh, I'll take I'll take that question too. Uh, it's it's possible, but pretty tricky. And part of the reason that it's tricky is that community choice programs don't actually manage the grid and grid services. So, for example, I live in the the peninsula of the Bay Area, and so. I'm, I'm closely paying attention to the Peninsula Clean Energy Program because I know that's coming online very soon. So when this, my CCA comes online in my, in my neighborhood, they will be providing an alternate uh, source of energy 
but they would still be delivering that energy. They would be contracting for the energy, but PG&E, since they run this service territory, would still be the entity responsible for delivering and distributing that energy. So in order for a CCA or a CCE to take on the role of a DSO, a distribution system operator, I think would require a big shift in the way that things are currently working. So my short answer would be no. I don't think that community choice energy programs are really um, very close to be, being able to take on that role. Thank you, Katie. Uh, here's a very specific question that um, I hope you can answer. Um, is the 12.4% local renewables in the business as usual case the current number or the 20 years from now number? If the latter, what is the current percentage of local renewables? Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, in fact, if you want to turn the PowerPoint presentation control back to me, Josh, I can pull up that slide so sure. that everyone knows what we're talking about. This will just take me a second. This slide. Yes, so looking at this slide, this 12.4% number is what the question is about. And that number refers to the amount of load that would be met by local renewables 20 years from now. So on the projected business as usual case, we expect that 20 years from now, only 12.4% of our energy will be delivered by local renewables. Uh, right now, the numbers vary a little bit by which, which utility is, um, is serving your area, but it's, uh, I believe it's about 4% per, is the average. About 4% of our, our local load is, of our, our load is being met by local renewables. So if you contrast that to the tax fix projections, uh, the amount of local, the, ma the amount of load that would be met by local renewables would be much higher. It'd be closer to 22.2% after the next 20 years. Excellent. Thank you very much for clarifying that. The, um, the webinar is at an end. And uh, I thank you very much for everyone who attended. Um, once again, for more information on the Clean Coalition's TAC campaign, go to clean-coalition.org slash TAC, um, or you can email Katie Ramsey at katie at clean-coalition.org. If you're interested in supporting the campaign, please email Daryl Mahalik at daryl at dynamicgridcouncil.com. And um, also, please be sure to follow the Clean Coalition on Facebook and or Twitter. So I want to thank Daryl and Katie for their great presentations, and thank you very much once again, we'll see you next time.